hats off to the principal's office, I go. Yo, you think this is bad? Wait till I get my report card. G'day and welcome to episode 15 of the Principal's Office, uh, the vodcast series which aims to give viewers uh, a greater insight into great educational practice, certainly much more than a nine to three job. I'm your host, Matt Lewis, and today I am very fortunate to have three sensational educators in high school settings uh, with me today, uh, the Principal of Asheville Boys, uh, Mr Dwayne Hopwood. Uh, the principal of Belmore Boys High School, my old high school, uh, Miss Hala Ra- Ramadan, and the head teacher uh, of science and STEM at Fairvale High School, as well as being the coordinator of Lachlan Macaulay, uh, sorry, Macquarie College, uh, uh, Mrs Shireen Spiru. Welcome, guys, and thank you so much. Given, you know, this is a COVID episode that we're doing it online uh, and there is so much coming across your desks uh, currently, um, I really do appreciate your time today and in, in, in joining us to give us a greater picture about what high schools are all about. To get us started today, um, I, I thought, uh, you know, you, you've all got a uh, vast experience within the education department. I thought you might have a funny story in education that you might want to share with our viewers uh, to start off with. And we might start with you, Dwayne. Uh, I've certainly got a, enough funny stories to write a book, I reckon, but uh uh, it's been a very popular part of our episode. So, Dwayne, a funny story in education for you thus far? Yeah, I mean, I don't want people to steal my idea, but one day when I do end this, I'm going to write Public Education the Musical, I think. You know, this, is <laughs> year, this is year 32 for me. Um, I, I think one of the things that, that's brought me joy, and it's a, real, it's a real COVID story, is the fact that times may change and technology changes, but kids never do change. And being at a boys' school, and Ahala will know this as well, and being at a boys' school, teenage boys are always just teenage boys. And I still teach, I'm an English teacher, I still teach as well as being the principal. And one of the things I have noticed with my year 10 class, when you're looking at a screen like this and you've got this Brady Bunch tile of, of 30 very small pictures, every so often when you're in the middle of a lesson, there's something that's not quite right there. Some of these kids appear to be very, very still. And it wasn't actually until I came home to my own 14-year-old son who told me apparently that it's just uh, common knowledge amongst the kids. You take a screenshot of yourself, you wait for the teacher to look away, you put it as your background, you can walk away. So that's what they've been doing apparently. <laughs> Either that's an indictment on technology or my teaching. Yeah, maybe. Oh, no, I think technology, uh, to be honest. But uh, like how, how ingenious uh, are kids these days to, to, you know, this is only a recent development. They go, yeah, I can... I can uh, flunk the system uh sort of uh there so unfortunate Dwayne I, I, I hope not everybody on that uh, video call or uh zoom calls teams meeting whatever it was uh did that to you and I'm you sure they have a coordinated thing. program yeah yeah okay mm-hmm. but that's a good one I like that one um Harla what about you well mine is funny now but it wasn't funny back then it was in my first um, holiday as a principal um, at Belmore Boys High School. Um, I arrived and I decided that we were not in a very good financial place, so we were going to paint the school ourselves. And in order to ensure that the kids don't um, or take ownership of the whole place, um, we're going to involve them. So I speak to I spoke to the kids and they said, "Yeah, we're happy to help me. So as long as you um, do a barbecue at the school for us while we're painting the front office." And I'm Surely agreed with that. It had to be a charcoal barbecue, of course, culturally appropriate for Belmore. Um, Anyway, so I'm sitting in the office curing meat and whatever it is um, for the boys. And one of the boys calls me out and says, Miss, Miss, come and have a look at our work. I look at the walls. The walls are okay. Smudges here and there, not a problem. And then I look at the carpet. So the idea of painting the school was to save money. I look at the carpet, the kids had actually stepped into the bucket of paint and walked all over the carpet, even though we had drop sheets and you name it, they still walked all over the carpet. So I found myself as a new principal with a bucket of boiling water, some soap and a brush, trying to get the stains off the carpet. Took me the whole day basically to get it off the carpet. We still have a couple of smudges here and there, but it was 
it was not funny back then. Now I look at it and I smile or I think about it and I smile, but it was really lovely to have that culture of collaboration between the kids and the teachers because we had about 15 um, kids and about 10 teachers painting the front office. Yeah, certainly good for relationships, but uh, best laid plans, I suppose. Uh, I don't know if I would have got down on my knees and uh, hands and knees and scrubbed the carpet. I probably would have gone, hey, look at this carpet, AMU. How about you replace this carpet for me? Yeah. Um, it looks like someone's painted all over it type of thing. Yep. Oh, yeah. Fresh. Oh, I didn't know it was fresh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't in the job description um, when I applied for principal, that's for sure. No, that's right. That's right. But many and varied is a principal's job. That's right. Uh, that's a good one, Harla. Thank you for that. Uh, Shireen, uh, a funny story. From you, okay. And across two <laughs> different uh, 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 places at the moment. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do one of that. I was actually a classroom teacher at the time. Um, I was teaching at Kings Road High School and I had a year 12 physics class. And they knew it was my birthday. So they got me a cake. They didn't know how old I was. I had my youngest, my oldest son was, um, I think he was seven at the time. And my oldest, my youngest one was five at the time. And they were next door. Like I had them just for one year in the school next door to me. And they asked me how, how old I was. And I said 21. But they knew that my kids were actually next door. And they did the maths and they said, Miss, how can your kids be, how can you be 21? Your son's seven. I went, yeah, yeah I know that. And they said, that means you had him when you were 14. And I went, yeah, that's right. And I said, look, my mum's an English teacher. She actually, you know, retired to, um, to look after my kid. And they actually bought the story oh, for about half an hour. And I just went to them, guys, I'm really sorry to do this to you. I'm actually 35. <laughs> and it was one of those things that it was real. Like, I couldn't believe the fact that it was, they actually believed me. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of this. I mean, there was one I couldn't didn't think I could say on, on, um, on here, Matthew, but I'll tell you that one privately one day. <laughs> uh, but, uh, hey, imagine if you just left that story as it was. And the uh, parent reaction. That would have been really fun for your principal back then to uh, do. Oh, uh, look, it was just, I, I couldn't tell them. I couldn't I couldn't hold it over. Like I was, I had to stop myself from laughing. <laughs> you know what I mean? For the first, for, for about 20 minutes, I thought, guys, look, they were year 12. Yeah. So it was, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stories when I was a client as a head teacher, but that was one of the funniest ones that came to mind yesterday. Yeah. Lovely, me. lovely. Never come across that in my roles. You, Dwayne? No? No. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> it's all good. All right, so we've got some questions this afternoon and, and basically one each, but I, I want you to weigh in, uh, certainly if, uh, you know, you feel you've got something to add. Uh, you're all uh, highly intelligent people that, uh, you know, run schools or colleges in, in uh, such a, a unique and, and uh, wonderful way. Uh, so please don't, don't hesitate to weigh in on uh, different questions. Uh, my first question is for Harla. Hala, um, tell our viewers about uh, the need for diversity in a high school teacher's role. And we sort of got a backstory behind this, I think. Um, you know, you, like you could be appointed for some reason, but they're, you know, and, and trained to do something in particular, but we might be called on to do something else in a high school situation um, because, you know, certainly smaller high schools, uh, you know, we need um, sometimes our teachers to be a jack of some trades, not all of them, but some trades are good, um, and, be, and mainly because they've got other skills. Why does this happen in high schools and uh, why do we need this diversity? Okay, I'll just give you some examples about what's currently happening in my school. So I have a PE teacher teaching um, a full agriculture uh, agriculture load, um, 9 to 12. I have a HISI teacher um, who's retrained as a um, construction t- teacher. I have a HISI teacher who's actually my numeracy um, expert. And the way that happened was because she started in the maths faculty as, a, as an early careers teacher, um, and she taught basically maths for a year before she transitioned back to hizzy. So I guess from a point of from a school point of view, it's great to have um, staff who've got different um, disciplines or different codes. It allows you to fill vacancies. However, um, it is very common in high school, certainly at my high school over the years that I've been at Belmore, to book a casual um, to be on a temporary contract for one particular area and to end up in a different area altogether. So one of my PE staff, for example, has ended up in four different faculties um, and doing RLSP training um, this year. As a, sorry, RLSP work with um, some of the kids this year as well. Um, look, 
My best experience um, in terms of teaching and the best results in terms of teaching that I've re- that I've had as a teacher myself were in my first year of teaching extension one and extension two. I ended up getting 13 out of the 15 E4s that the school actually got that year. I guess when you are um, looking at content through a fresh lens, a different lens, when there's discomfort, there's great learning um, as well. So more than happy to share different stories, but um, if if other people want to jump in about their experience and people who, um, you know, are in their schools with multiple disciplines and and working across faculties, I find it a great strength for for us as a school and for us as a staff. One of the things that you start out doing when you're at university, especially at a high school, you, you, you train for a subject area and like Hala, you end up often teaching other things. Like I was adamant when I was at uni that I was going to be a history teacher, that I was never going to teach English. I've never taught a day of history in my career, but I've taught English for 32 years. I've taught German, I've taught drama, and I've even quite scarily taught maths at one point as well. So sometimes those experiences are the best experiences because you you end up looking at a whole different area from a very different perspective. I find in a way, um, sorry, Shireen, I find in a way it allows you to maybe teach your content um, a little bit better. Um, I mean, I'm science maths uh, maths trained. I'm a science teacher at heart, um, Shireen, but I ended up just going through the maths pathway and, you know, to all the way to principalship, I guess. So over to you. I was just going to say, like, we're a massive school. We're 1,550 kids. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Um, we have a lot of staff that are, you know, teach. Like I have a large faculty. I've got 12 staff um, plus myself. And we ha- and I have some of my staff teaching geography or some of my staff te- teaching, um, you know, they had one period of English because we don't have, you know, we, we try and, and allocate as much as we can so we can, you know, not have, um, you know, many casuals or split classes. But, you know, in a big school, it, you know, we do have to um, have... A wide variety of subjects. Well, I'm lucky in my in my faculty that I've actually got a full science cohort of, of staff. They're all science trained. I'm very very lucky in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are so many schools out there that don't. And the divert, like you were saying, um, Hala, it's it's one of these things that, as at a high school level, we need to really be able to deal with. And when I was at Kingsgrove, I had to teach home economics. Um, you know, and I wasn't actually trained in home economics, mm-hmm. but I know oh, it's a similar to a lab in terms of the. Um, in terms of the safety practices and so forth, but it's very, very different in terms of the actual content. Um, so, yeah, all of us have had to teach something other than our, um, our own KLA at some stage. Yeah, but out of it, uh, adversity or, or, you know, challenge comes a greater teacher, doesn't it? And uh, when we are challenged in that way, um, I, I, I suppose, uh, and particularly early on in our careers, we, we look for that challenge moving forward. And I think that that's what makes our really great teachers uh, in our system is that challenge and wanting to be challenged uh, further on, um, uh, you know, and uh, th- th- there's nothing like getting thrown in the deep end sometimes and it is it does prove to be a little bit uh, too hard, but for any of our pre-service teachers or early career teachers out there, um, you know, it, it, there's always going to be that support, uh, whether it's uh, from executive, from the head teacher, from other teachers on that faculty, um, you'll get through it. Uh, and with those new skills, you actually become, uh, I don't know, a, a, a more valuable teacher as a result. Uh, and, um, you know, mm-hmm. don't forget to also, you know, think about the skills that you've learned along the way uh, and reflect on that um, because they will stand you in good stead for other uh, periods of challenge. Uh, well said, everyone. Uh, it was uh, absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. Dwayne, I'll, I'll uh, put the next question to you. Uh, well-being has become a massive issue in all schools since the interruption of uh, COVID. Um, can you tell our viewers what your school does uh, to look after its students? Because uh, I know that quite intimately and uh, mm-hmm. what you've done is, is certainly outstanding. Um, even tell us, uh, like, I, like um, uh, I'm intimating now, what you've done personally for those year 12 kids this year, um, uh, you know, uh, as far as their well-being is concerned as well. Yes, yeah, so, so as we're recording this, everybody on the panel knows that we're planning to come back to school um, and, and that's going to present its own challenges. So, so we've obviously been really quite concerned about the kids 
Um, and I've been concerned about the staff as well because COVID has, has presented us with a unique challenge and an opportunity, I suppose, um, for, for an unknown landscape that none of us know really what was going to happen or even how things are going to unfold. And I think part of what we've been doing and what schools have been doing are the really obvious things, like the, the, the structural things that we would expect of any school, of the checking and the monitoring of attendance and, 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 and att achievement and the fact that the kids are on track. And I think the most important thing is really, in terms of wellbeing, is the recognition that our core business is teaching and learning, that we're educators, we're schools, it's learning, but happy kids who are mentally and physically happy learn better. And, and those two, two things, the learning and the well-being, are, are intertwined and you can't separate them. So connect, we know from research and from practical experience that connected kids, kids who are connected to schools, are happier and, and perform better. Now, obviously, COVID presented its unique challenges for all of us because our, our kids weren't on site, most of them, and they were at home. So... In normal times, right, when we're all on site together, I think um, especially when you're entering the profession as, as a beginning teacher in your early career, is that um, what we say is important uh, as teachers, but what we do is as important or even more important because we have in our, our school, you know, we've got 750 teenage boys. So that presents 1,500 pairs of eyes who are watching us all the time. And they're not just watching us, about how we interact with the kids. They're watching how we interact together as a staff and how we interact with our community and the respectful relationships we have with each other and with parents. So I think being that role model without even realising you're the role model is a really, really important facet of the kids' wellbeing. One of the things that we're very strong on is about student voice and making sure that the boys have their, their ability to say certain things. So one of the things that Matt's alluded to is during COVID, we've had to make a whole lot of decisions about how we're going to deliver things online. And we've involved especially our senior leaders in co-designing everything along the way. I've met personally with them every week on Zoom like this and as we've approached each phase of this, and we're about to do the same thing with the next cohort uh, on Friday, as we approach each phase of this, we've involved the kids in co-designing and getting their voice about what we should do. And, and that's been really useful, not just for lip service, but really understanding where they're coming from. And I found it absolutely invaluable. Um, I think also that individual connection is really, really important. Trying to have as much of an individual connection with the kids as possible. We're not as big a school as Shireen's coming from, and obviously your context makes this a bit different. Um, but with Year 12 especially, I've made sure that I have individually connected with each of the boys. I've held meetings every week with all of Year 12, besides just their, their leadership team. And I've been in individual contact with them either personally like this or through email or through other means. When I've been, uh, we've been using their mobile numbers, I've got to say. So when we send them an email, um, we've been sending them a text message through our computer system as well so that they know to check it and that way that they get back to us. Um, and, and that's worked so far very well from our, for us, just keeping that individual connection going. And now we're about to move into that next phase where the kids are about to come back on site from next Monday, where they've got three weeks before their HSC left. It's It's been a challenging time, but I've also found it quite an energising time in a way as well. Look, you know, I, and I've got to say, I, I think that, you know, coming back into the school, I think they will feel so much more supported um, because of those interventions and, um, you know, and, and, and probably a lot more uh, connection to the school, um, you know. So, yeah, anyone else got anything to add there? I was going to say, um, echo what Dwayne was actually saying, that kids always remember how you make them feel. They might not remember what you say, but they will always remember how you make them feel. And for us, um, 
for, for kids to be comfortable enough to come to the principal's office and say, I need this, this and that. And sometimes it is intimate details about their lives or sometimes it's details that other, people's might, other people might perceive as embarrassing for them to be able to come and share all of that with me. Um, that's a great privilege. And that really shows that connection um, that those kids have with their school, but also with the leadership team at the school. During COVID, we found that we're providing a different service. We became a service provider um, for our families um, in a different way, you know, other than learning and education, of course. We were connecting families with health services. We were connecting families with charities to support them through their financial difficulties. Um, we were contacting housing on behalf of parents. We were contacting doctors and um, and supporting families in, in doing well-being checks and things like that. So I think um, what you do with your families um, usually, um, I guess, what, what your normal practice is in terms of student well-being um, was very evident um, during COVID times when, when everyone was stretched and, every, and things were complex. So great work, um, Dwayne. I also think working to, working together as well. I mean, obviously, without going into details, we're quite different in terms of ge geography. But Harla and I share a family, and we've worked together to make sure that that family is okay during a very difficult time. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say. No, I was just going to say. I know that our senior executive have actually contacted, like they have meetings with the U twelves constantly. Um, you know, I know. Oh, I speak on behalf of my staff. I know they've actually, you know, contacted the kids via email, via phone, even their parents just to check up on them. I think, you know, especially in a subject like physics and chemistry and biology, where it's actually quite a tough subject. The kids teaching it online is actually quite difficult, and um, the kids have been a bit stretched in it. And so I know that my staff have been really great in, you know, contacting the kids, making sure they're okay, um, and not putting too much pressure on the kids. I mean, they've got enough pressure on as it is. And I guess, you know, I know a lot of kids probably won't, won't agree with this, but they've got a bonus three weeks, I guess, as well to, to consolidate that learning that they have done, you know, in the over the online learning part where they can actually come to school and talk to the teachers. Like our students are actually using their normal timetable um, from next week. Um, they're actually coming. They're not, uh, it's not mandatory for them to come to school, but most of them are using their normal timetable and so the teachers will be there to actually help them um, all the time, and I, you know, I think that's that's. Although we're not back at school, you know, a lot. It's only Year Twelve teachers are going back next week, and um, you know, I think it's great that the schools actually provided that for the students, the actual timetable to come and go, um, to actually attend their classes and have some consolidation of what they've learned during online because it has been difficult for them. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I want to grab uh, something that uh, Dwayne said, and that's uh, you know that. You've got, uh, you know, 1,500 pairs of eyes looking at uh, you all the time and and they, they don't just see a role model, they see the role model, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, the principal or a head teacher or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they do. They do see what you do. Kids as young as kindergarten, right mm -hmm. through to year 12, they're, they're watching. And I, you'll like this analogy, uh, Shireen, but uh, they're like litmus paper. You know, mm -hmm. litmus paper is that uh, little bit of paper in science that we use uh, and, the, and the term we use for that is they learn and they continue to learn and draw in the, the very best experiences uh, that we're giving them. And, uh, you know, wellbeing has become such um, a massive part of what we do. But without that school connection and that identity with the school and its teachers, you know, it's, it's very hard to make that, um, you know, that learning connection for the children. I've mm -hmm. got to say, Harla, you know, Belmore Boys has completely changed since... Uh, uh, Mr. Barry B and his uh, cane wielding uh, <laughs> exploits back in the eighties, um, but uh, and change for the better. Uh, I've got to say, but um, thanks for those answers, guys. Well, just wonderful, just wonderful. Shireen, I'll, I'll direct the next one at you. I've known you for a very long time, and um, for the benefits of the podcast, podcast, um, your husband is uh, someone I've known since year one at Belmore North Public School. Went all the way through school with, and still we're great friends today, great mates. Um, I know you very well, so this one is certainly directed at you. Passion plays a very important part of any teaching situation in any school. Can you tell us where your passions have led you and how that journey started? Because it's an amazing journey. Okay, so I'll start basically. My parents are both teachers. They taught from 1971 until, I don't know, when my son was born, 1996. 
both English and maths teachers in, um, in Sydney, the Department of Education. And my sisters are both teachers in the Department of Education. I'm a teacher in the Department of Education. Um, both my cousins are teachers in the public, in the, um, well, they're not in the department, but they were. And so we're a family of teachers. We could actually open our own school um, if we really wanted to. So my passion started from there. Um, I used to come home and mum and dad would, they would love what they were doing. And as you can see, the three, the three daughters have all become teachers. I'm high school and the others are doing primary, but it didn't matter because they brought the love of education back into the house. And, um, and I'll just add to my son, my younger son is also a maths teacher in the Catholic system, but he's a maths teacher. And he, he was supposed to be doing occupational therapy. And after one year, he goes, no, I don't want to do it. I said, why did you even choose? And he goes, I don't know. But he goes, I want to be a teacher. I said, do it. So he's just joined. He's always wanted to be a teacher. Um, and he's joined it. And he loves the fact that he's teaching. I mean, unfortunately, his first year of teaching is, you know, online. But it's a lot to learn. And, and that's, that's where the passions come from. I guess it's just role model, as you were saying, Dwayne, before. It's a role model of what was before and what we, you know, we can just emulate now, that now and to our students and, and for me, for my own children. Um, look, I've always loved the idea of being a teacher with mum and dad um, there, as I said before. Um, and I started, my, I started my teaching back in 1997 in the public system. And um, I became a head teacher in 2006 after doing a whole lot of stuff, you know, coordinator, year advisor, which, I, you know, um, for all the pre-service teachers out there, year advising, if you're in a high school, year advising is one of the best things you can do. It is one of the most rewarding roles in a school. Um, it, just, it's, it just gives you that whole school, whole school perspective without actually leading a faculty. Um, you're looking at the well-being, the, learn, the learning and the well-being of the students at a different level. And I think it's one of the most rewarding um, things I ever did. Like, I do enjoy my job. I do love my job. And I think Matthew knows that. But um, it is, uh, year advising is one of the best things you can do. So that actually, being a year advisor for six years at Kingsgrove put me on the path to become a head teacher. At, um, and I took that role up at Kingswood High School. Um, after that, you know, when you get to a stage in, in, your, in your career, you think, oh, I'm sort of at a standstill. And I spoke to my principal at the time, and he said, well, why don't you take a secondment to the department? And I went, I don't want to work in the department. He goes, no, 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 go for it. He, did, he goes, I did it, and I loved it. So I thought, okay. I looked at one, and there was one called Lock and Macquarie College, and it was actually due the next day. I thought, I'll have a stab at it. I thought, why not? Look, it sounds like exactly what I'm, uh, what I'm after. And when I start, and I got the job, you know, that, that uh, the next day, and when I started that job, it was a group of seven schools that were involved in it. And, um, and when I was only at seven schools and they wanted us to bring Granville. So Murat Dista was at said back then, like this is a, an old word now, said, um, and he was a chair of it. And he asked me if I would bring Granville boys into it, Granville South, well, yeah, okay. And from there, Lock Macquarie College grew to basically serve the whole state. Um, so I'm at the moment, and then in 2012, end of 2012, yeah, we had a restructure in the department, and I was based at the University of Western Sydney back then, or Western Sydney University back then, and I was then transferred to Fever Hospital, which is where I am now. So, so I've been there since 2013. Um, and basically, I've been doing both roles um, at the same time. Um, Fairville High School is a large school, as I said, 1,550. When I got there, it was about 1,200, but we've grown a lot since the last um, eight and a half, nine years. Um, and, you know, with a very diverse faculty, when I first started in science there, we had about seven classes of year 11 and 12 of each subject of, you know, in year 11, 12 science subjects. Now we've got 11, 11 and 12 sub, uh, science classes. So the school has grown, the science faculty has grown, you know, and my staff are absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it without them, really. And um, but then on, on the side of that, in my after in my spare time, if we have that, after three o'clock, I actually run. Um, I organise things for Lock and Macquarie College, which is basically um, preparing pre-service teachers. So I, I used to teach at Western Sydney University. I get the pre-service teachers into schools. I run professional development. For, we run professional development for staff. We run student programs for science and maths um, through the university as well. So. You know, if I didn't love what I do, I would have given one of those up by now. But I know that I know that LMC or Lock Macquarie College actually keeps me going, keeps my passion for education going. Um, 
you know, I, I look, it's just, it is what it is, and I, and I do enjoy it. It does take a lot of my time, but it is one of the most rewarding things I've ever done, and, you know, and I try and support, you know. And nowadays it's actually not just the department that we, we're helping in terms of um, LMC. We actually um, have opened it up now to other educational sectors um, just so they can come in, you know, the conf we have a science maths conference or network meetings. We write HSE exams. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that we do and, you know, I guess my passion probably comes out because it's one of those things I really do enjoy doing. Yeah, I think uh, Lachlan Macquarie College and the department has certainly lucked out when they uh, had you apply for the role because it's, it's, it's a massive role. You know, and, and given your teaching load uh, as a science head teacher as well, I, sometimes I, I don't know whether you've got enough hours in the day, uh, Shireen, but uh, it is a wonderful thing that you do. And, of course, the, the links that you do have with Western Sydney University, which is the, you know, prime university that we uh, deal with, with the principal's office as well. Um, hopefully you're also making sure that those teachers are coming out of university and into our public oh, education system, <laughs> number one, of course. But, uh, you know... Um, yeah, like there's other people have passions for other things and, and it could be sport and, and you know, in, in a high school setting, uh, you know, teachers, uh, you know, or head teachers or whoever can still play a ray, role in um, CHS sport at a, a zone, a regional or state level. Uh, you know, there's many different things. You know, we've got um, the school's uh, spectacular or, you know, there's dance uh, groups at a, a regional level. There's so many different things that we can do as teachers and if our passion and our heart is in that as well, uh, it certainly makes our job even much more enjoyable uh, yeah. type of thing. And I, I, one thing I say to young teachers as they come out, if you can, if you can really enjoy what you do, it really doesn't seem like work at all. Uh, yeah. It seems like a lot of fun. Uh, and if you can manage to have a lot of fun in the 30-odd years uh, that we've all been uh, basically in education, yeah. uh, then, you know, uh, time passes very very quickly, and then all of a sudden you become a, a very old man who's trying to uh, uh, trying to grow a, a mullet. But anyway, it's all good. I was now, just going to say, just, oh, go sorry, Don. I was just going to end in my one, but actually by just saying education. For me, education is not just about teaching, though. It's just about getting the best out of all the students and the staff that are around you. And I just think that's really important. Um, you know, by and I think one of the things that we really focus on in terms of LMC is actually professional development of staff so to that, so that we are, they are able to get the best out of students. That's what I was just going to say. Sorry, Hala. No, all good. One of the things that I actually say to early careers teachers, um, if, if they've got heart, I will work with them to build the skill and they will get there. If they've got skill and they've got no heart, they shouldn't be in teaching at all. Certainly yeah. in schools with um, significant diversity, certainly in schools with um, diverse um, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, students um, who've had interrupted learning, such as refugee students, those are the kids. I mean, all kids deserve great teachers, but kids from non-English speaking backgrounds from low socioeconomic communities deserve the best teachers. When I see a child who missed out on five years of schooling because he's a he had to live in a refugee camp and he had to work between the ages of 10 and 15, and then I see him make it to university, uh, you know, after three years with us at Belmore Boys High School. I mean, if that doesn't give you um, the inspiration to do more yeah. and, and to work harder, I don't know what would. Yeah, I, I agree, Hella. I totally agree. We're in a very low socioeconomic uh, uh, as well, and we've got we get all the refugees from Fairfield IEC. So I know exactly what you're talking about. It's so important. And you know, when I used to teach at um, Western Sydney University pre-service teachers, I used to tell them how it is. You know, and so they actually understand that. You know, they've got to really like when they go to practice, it's where they learn. They can go to university and, and hear it. But where do they actually learn the skills? It's actually at school and actually listen to the, you know, those that have been there for a while and ups and downs and, you know, and people have got to understand that this is you've got to love what you do. You have to love what you do. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Matthew. It's certainly a place for theory and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, we get that. But, you know, it's that on-the-job training that uh, you, I remember all of my uh, teaching pracs, I've got to say. <laughs> can't remember with, uh, the theory, I've got to say. But, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed my teaching practice, but they were, you know, chucked in the deep end, I am drowning type of situations. But when you get a good teacher that you're paired with, uh, they, 
they really do point the way forward for you. Yeah, and you, you absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. That was sensational, guys. Thank you so much for, um, you know, uh, uh, your wonderful answers and uh, giving of yourselves to uh, our pre-service and uh, edu early education uh, teachers. Um, can I say that, uh, yeah, they, they were just absolutely sensational answers and, and I got exactly what I wanted from each one of you and that was what Harla just mentioned, the heart uh -huh. of education because we do, you guys lead with heart and passion uh, and that's why you make a, a massive difference uh, in your high schools or, you know, and Lachlan Macaulay, uh, Macquarie College as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're so well known for what you do. So thank you very much for that. But now it's time for the song challenge. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so a you brief know rundown of what the song challenge means. I'm going to read out words. I'm not going to sing them. I'm just going to read them out. Uh, and, look, we've made history today because it's the first uh, Principal's uh, Office episode uh, that has had three panellists. Usually we have two, so we've got three. So this uh, for this one, we have three prizes to give out, three minties, all right, an Australian institution, the old minty. Now, someone could win all three. If they win all three, they could choose to be greedy and take them all or they could do <laughs> whatever. But there's three things that you've got to give me after I've read out some lyrics and you can just blurt out the answers when you want. What I want to know is... The name of the song, the artist, and for this particular episode, the year the song came out. All right. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a hint because it was a decade in which I still might have been at high school. Okay. So I'll leave that with you to start off with. Are you ready for the song challenge? Yeah, okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm going to make a change. Michael Once Jackson. in my life. Man Michael in the Jackson. Michael Jackson. Man in the Mirror, Michael Jackson. All right, we've got Michael Jackson from Shireen and we've got Man in the Mirror from Dwayne. All right, what year? 1987. Ooh. 1985. Nah, now, you guys are locked out because... You uh, both have answered incorrectly. So Harla, Harla's very young. It may have been. It may have been when you're in your twelve. Oh, okay. Bicentennial for Australia. Double figures. <laughs> I wasn't even in the country at that point. So, okay, so Harla's only twenty-one years old. That's not. That's good. right. <laughs> 1988. 87, then there's 1988. 1988 it was. All right, so we've got, what do you reckon, Dwayne and Shireen, we we'll still give uh, a minty to Harlan? Yeah. Yes. yes, I think we will. I think we will. Minty's all around. They're virtual at the moment, but they will come to you very, very soon. Um, yeah, look, you know, I've, you guys had a hard time in giving me some artists. So, yes, Shireen, I took artistic license there. Uh, you know, I'm a massive, because I'm a knew that he would have to put Michael Jackson. He has no choice. <laughs> I have done other episodes. This is the 15th episode. It's only the second time Michael Jackson has appeared. Uh, look, uh, I've got to say thank you so much again for taking time out of a very, very busy, uh, busy and challenging time uh, within schools at the moment uh, to have a chat to me about uh, high school experiences and uh, what makes uh, you know successful high school teachers. Um, really appreciate your time with that. Um, I've got to thank uh, my uh, uh, executive producer, Erwin, who's always there uh, behind the scenes making sure that I don't stuff it up too much. Uh, so thank you, Erwin, for all of your work. Uh, for everybody that's viewing, um, thank you for having a look. Um, don't forget to hit us up on our socials. We've got our the Principal's Office uh, Facebook page. Um, we've got Twitter under my own account, Matty D. Lewis, uh, we've got LinkedIn uh, under Matthew Lewis as well. Uh, and we've also got the YouTube account. And what we'd like you to do at the end of this episode, the arrows will point down to subscribe. So please subscribe. The more subscribers we have, the, the uh, more notoriety we get. Uh, and uh, certainly our messages get out there far and wide to our pre-service and our early career teachers. But uh, again, thank you guys so much for being a part of it. Uh, this has been episode 15 of the principal's office. 
Uh, we'll see you again another time. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. It's off to the principal's office in the car.